Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for the invitation to come and uh, give this talk. Um, I had the invitation uh, 14 months ago, and of course, I, you know, 14 months ahead, I always said, yes, fine, of course. And then uh, about a year later, you get a, a request saying, well, what are you going to talk about? And I thought, oh, I don't know. Um, and then I kind of took inspiration from one of the, uh, the, the members of the audience here, the, the lovely Debbie Payne, who is the most optimistic person I know. I thought, well, I've been arguing with her for ages and ages about how awful the situation is in Africa, so I'm actually going to have a go at telling her how seriously bad this it is. So if you want a, a, an antidote to this, you'll have to invite Debbie next year. Um, OK, pro progress or pretense. Um, OK, so oh, I've forgotten my copy of this month's. Uh, I, I was going to hold it up. It's, never mind. Uh, if you just look at the, uh, the roundup um, in this year's, uh, this, this spring's issue of the, the bulletin, you get headlines like this. More than half the world's raptors declining. Winter habitat of wood warbler is in trouble. Armed conflicts in Sahara and Sahel threaten wildlife with extinction. Proceliform Armageddon in Gough. Hooded vulture faces extinction in Edo State, Nigeria. Mara wetlands biodiversity is being destroyed. Yemen urged to halt damaging activities on Socotra. Marshall Eagle has declined by 60% over 20 years in South Africa. I mean, this is a pretty depressing kind of uh, list of stuff, but this is staple. Whenever you open magazines which do this kind of global or uh, regional roundup, you get this kind of story. And it just, you, after a bit, you start to think, can I take any more? So of course, there is a kind of pushback uh, in this extraordinary new um, phenomenon called uh, conservation optimism. Um, I'm all in favor of uh, uh, this movement. Um, they're putting together some important evidence about how things really can be changed. Nonetheless, I, there's a kind of way in which you've got to be a little careful, in my view, uh, not to uh, sugar the pill too strongly. Um, the idea that things are going well uh, is easily um, conveyed if you espouse a title like conservation optimism. Um, and it puts me in mind of the very last scene of um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I'm sure every single member of the audience has seen this film. Um, it ends with uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance um, holed up in a, uh, some Mexican fort somewhere. And uh, the Mexican army comes around and there's about sort of two or 300 soldiers all pointing their rifles at where these two are going to appear. And Butch says um, to, uh, to Sundance, Butch, what do you think? Sundance, can't tell. Butch, I bet it's just one guy. For a minute, I thought we were in trouble. And then there's a very loud bang. Um, so there's a certain kind of optimism which doesn't necessarily work. So when we look at Africa, we get this kind of distribution of problems, um, which, uh, as they uh, pile up, start to make you think, well, things aren't doing too well, but they're not that different perhaps from anywhere else on the planet. Still, it's a, quite a big list. Um, and then there's this issue called China. How serious is, a, is, is China as a threat to different parts of the world, and in particular Africa? When you look, look one or two countries are really um, selling themselves off uh, eastwards. Um, Angola with this amazing amount of debt, uh, Ethiopia with a very large amount, and then uh, you can see a proportion of debt in Zambia and Djibouti, very, very high indeed. These things threaten to destabilize the ability of these countries to be able to invest in natural resources for themselves. Uh, there's a nice little headline, China giving Ethiopia 20 years more to pay back a loan for its, it, the, the Djibouti railway that it needed after it messed up its relations with Eritrea. Um, so uh, there's a certain amount of standing up that needs to be done, I suppose, in some ways, to other international forces. Uh, so looking at these, that list again, uh, but putting it in a sort of priority order, but also grouping by theme, uh, we get something like this with climate change, perhaps the most significant problem of all. Um, but we'll try and cover these in extreme, uh, extreme speed in a total skitter over the surface, which will reveal that I know nothing about any one particular subject. So climate change uh, as a kind of threat. 
Look, here's a, a, a paper that came out just in January about biodiversity uh, in the Afro-Arabian region. And we look at this little, little comment here. Uh, alarmingly, our results indicate that about 17% of the endemic mammals of the Afro-Arabian region uh, will go extinct before 2050. So that's, that's the mammals. So what about the birds? Well, we haven't done an analysis like that, but just to take one example, which I'm very familiar with, the wonderful African, uh, sorry, Ethiopian bush crow, which is one of the most marvelous birds in the world. Um, a piece of work was done on this by, oh, well, uh, a group of us, but a particular analysis by Paul Donald um, was able to demonstrate why the bush crow has such an incredibly restricted range. And it turns out that the range is the, the, the red line and the red patch behind it is the area of cooler, drier um, uh, habitat in which the bird is basically trapped. And that is only a few degrees cooler than everywhere else in southern Ethiopia. And there's been some work done. Uh, Paul and Rhys Green got together and put a, uh, a student on this, Andrew Bladen, uh, looking at uh, this in more detail, and his work, well, this will be is published online already, but it will be published in, I think, the next IBIS, um, showing that, indeed, the bush crow is truly incapable of withstanding higher temperatures. Uh, we looked at a couple of um, uh, starling species as well, which are perfectly capable of, of, of surviving very much increased temperatures, but the, the bush crow cannot take it. So this bird is trapped uh, in a, a, a little tiny pool of habitat, and it's, 2050 is perhaps um, about the time it's gonna go uh, off the planet, unless we can captive breed it or move it somewhere else. Just before I move on, uh, look at the, uh, the, the authorship lineup. Line up, uh, the last person on the first line, uh, Jaso Deng, and the first person on the second line, Galgalo Dadacha. Uh, we will meet them again, but it was very good of Andrew to put them on this 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 paper. Here's another uh, thing: the BirdLife has published. It's not very well known, but there is a, a document called "State of Africa's Birds." Um, it's nearly, nearly all uh, electronic. There are a few hard copies. I don't have one with me, unfortunately. But just um, it, this is from that document, and, and an assessment of 14 endemic species of bird in the Albertine Rift. And if you just look at the uh, right-hand side, uh, to the present and 2085, uh, only 66 years away, that's the lifetime of, of young children, uh, your grandchildren or, or my grandchildren, whatever, uh, they'll still be around to witness this um, uh, uh, appalling scenario where a lot of these endemic species are simply going to disappear. And when you look at uh, projections about um, the way that the Africa is going to be able to feed itself. You find um, documents like this, uh, which suggest that there are particular areas under climate change which will become extremely unstable from the point of view of food production, and they include this massive area uh, of, uh, of Africa and this massive area as well. So when, when, when food uh, starts to become difficult to produce in such regions because of climate change, goodness knows what kind of mass movement of uh, people there will inevitably be. And those people will be quite numerous. Um, this is, um, uh, the, the issue of overpopulation is, is not one which conservationists are com com comfortable with discussing in many ways because it's like it's other people's business. Nonetheless, we have to face up to the fact that um, more mouths to feed ultimately means uh, more land taken up in that production. And if that land is not capable of producing the food, then we have a serious problem. So this is the Lieben Plain in Ethiopia where I've been working for quite a lot, and it's the key site for the Lieben Lark. Um, and I just take this picture um, because there's this figure this about the uh, number of um, people living on the Lieben Plain itself. If you look at the 1994 column, uh, and the yellow figures, these two uh, peasant associations, Siminto and Miyaza, are the two uh, that represent the entire community that lives on the Lieben Plain. And you'll see that in 1994, there were five and a half thousand people more or less dependent on the plain. By 16 years later, that number had doubled to 11,000. In 16 years, 
If you make that a microcosm of what might be happening elsewhere and is happening elsewhere, you realize that this is basically unsustainable. It's got to be unsustainable. The gentleman in the photograph, standing at the back, is the father of every single other person in the photograph. And six of his children are not in it. How are conservationists supposed to be able to deal with saving the Liebenlark when we have to try to cater for these people's needs, completely legitimate needs? How do we do it? This is the kind of distribution uh, of, 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 of population growth, uh, and it's uncomfortable reading for Nigeria and Ethiopia in particular, but everywhere in Africa represents something of a problem. Look at this graph. Everywhere else in the world is flatlining. The African population by the end of this century is going to be four times higher than it is already. So agriculture is going to have to expand massively. But already, if you look at African savannas, you find that the amount of cropland in an area like this, for example, is already taken up. Uh, taking up um, uh, natural habitats. So uh, uh, the, uh, all these habitats are liable to be changed as people need to feed themselves quite legitimately. And pesticides will be used more and more, which will result in fewer and fewer insects and fewer and fewer birds. And it's potentially quite dangerous to humanity as well. We don't really understand this, but this gentleman should not be spraying pesticides without protective clothing, and he is. Already, there's, next month, there's going to be a conference in Tanzania about the dangers of this. You see, it's in, in just next month, and then the month after that, we've got another one. Uh, so suddenly, people are realizing how serious pesticides could be as a threat to the African environment. Overgrazing, if you're not trying to grow crops, you're trying to grow cattle, and overgrazing uh, can be a very serious issue too. And back to the Lieben Plain, uh, where people are largely dependent are on, on cattle. It looks nice and green here because it's just rain. It doesn't look like this for nearly all of the rest of the year. You'll see another picture in a second. But uh, there's far too many cattle. You can see they're not in good condition. Uh, when the grass used to grow tall because there weren't so many cattle, each cow could produce six litres of milk a day. Um, uh, these days, uh, such a cow can only produce half a litre of milk a day because there is just not the grass to feed them properly. And you can see from the ribs, uh, rib cage of the cow nearest us, uh, that's true, and how narrow uh, the hips of the, of the animals behind are. Uh, it matters to us because of the Liebenlark, this uh, lovely uh, bird. Oh, that's just another shot of the plane, uh, which shows more what it's like uh, most of the time. And you can see that isn't going to support very many cattle. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to the uh, feathers in the, uh, in the foreground. Uh, they are of Cory Bustard, and I'll explain what's happened uh, later. So um, this is my best photograph of a Liebenlark. I hope you appreciate it. It's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? You see it just there? Uh, 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 having a nice little song. Um, actually, it, you, some other people can get a bit closer. Um, so th this is uh, a wonderful bird uh, trapped again on this tiny little plane. It doesn't have the uh, capacity to disperse. Um, we did, uh, 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 we walked transects across the plane, 20 transects, um, fixed transects in 2007 for the first time. And on those transects, we found 67 birds. Last year, we did the same transects and we found seven. So this bird is heading the wrong way. And my hypothesis is that the grass is simply too short for reproductive success. The grass is just like a billiard table, and you can't expect birds to be able to breed. They may be able to survive, but they can't breed. So I reckon those seven are probably old age pensioners. Um, we're going to go out again this year to see what we find, uh, but uh, I think the prognosis is extremely serious. Uh, and the other place where the Liebenlark was known to occur, or was thought to still survive in Ethiopia. There's the uh, Jijiga in the easternmost part of the country. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, all the time. Uh, you can see it's extremely short grass as well. Um, Alfred Bade, who was a, someone who knew uh, the poet Arthur Rambo after he stopped being a poet, um, wrote about this area and he said when the grass is high it's easy to get lost in the vast plains of Mandau. Well the grass isn't high any longer and the reason is you can see is between the word overgrazing and the word Jijiga Ethiopia. 
uh, all those uh, small stock uh, munching it away. You can see that from this little picture, I found a little exclosure where you can see that the grass could actually grow quite tall, but perhaps not as tall as Alfred was talking about. On the other hand, if we jump to deforestation, uh, we always think about the big Congo forest and particularly the uh, DRC. And uh, yet when you look at this map, which uh, is basically a, 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 a satellite map of the distribution of, of uh, forest, you find that around Kisangani, there's uh, a lot of uh, deforestation moving uh, outwards and in the north and in the south as well. Uh, these forest blocks may take some time uh, before they're, they're cleared, but you can see that this is basically a poor looking prognosis. It may take decades, but it will happen. But deforestation has, it takes place in other ways as well. Uh, and th this is a, a, an example um, from uh, the Komaza website. The Kenya's wood deficit, just for taking fuel in order to cook food, uh, is quite enormous. Um, and if they want to meet it in 2030, uh, it will be the equivalent of taking 700,000 hectares of woodland a year to be able to cook. So the, the way that wood has been abstracted from the uh, African environment is something that I, we have to wake up to. And here's an example uh, of this. Um, the, so this is both browsing and fuel wood gathering effects in Senegal. This is an early satellite photograph from 1965. And this is a photograph from 2003. We just go back and look again. 65, 2003. Now, this is the kind of thing where it's a shifting baseline. And uh, people, I mean, this is obviously, when you look at them side by side, it's, it's appalling. But people don't look at them side by side. They see them over from one year to the next, uh, from one job to the next, whatever it might be. People don't pick up on how serious this change is. But it's appalling. It's quite appalling. And all the, all the animal life that we're particularly interested uh, in, in preserving is vanishing at the same time, and we don't really notice it. Then there's oil palm. Uh, oil palm is uh, obviously been taking over the tropics big time. This is a photograph from Sao Tome, uh, and you can see on the left-hand side some forest actually actively being cleared to make way for oil palm, which we desperately need for things like hair conditioner. Um, over the next five years, uh, from 2017, 22 million hectares, 220,000 square kilometers are expected to be converted. So with that, what impact that will have on our wildlife. Then we have aliens. Uh, mostly this is to do with birds on small islands. Um, so this is the uh, Reunion cuckoo shrike, which has been fighting a losing battle against black rats. Um, uh, but we, uh, and you can see that even with the, the, the fight that people put up, it's not always, it doesn't always work out. Here's ratus, and just look at the, the rate at which uh, rats can reinvade. So even if you get rid of them by enormous effort and uh, expense, they can come back within a few weeks. Uh, but we also have problems of aliens in other forms, like uh, water hyacinth. And down the bottom, I couldn't resist putting in yet another example from the Liebenlark. This is the, the 101 years ago, Jeffrey Archer found the first one uh, on the Tugwajali in Somaliland. Uh, but this area is now uh, taken over by this uh, invasive, toxic uh, weed from North America. Um, uh, Lake Chad is suffering seriously from, uh, uh, from this problem as well. And other things, too, have caused uh, the, the, the drainage and the dry out of, of uh, Lake Chad. So that in the 1960s, it was 25,000 square kilometers now. It's 1,300 square kilometers. Uh, uh, so again, what, you ask yourself the question, how many bird species have disappeared or how many, uh, what population levels have changed? It's not going to be for the better. And uh, it's just a, a little uh, map across uh, that, the region, uh, the Sahelian region. 
showing how uh, dams and diversion for irrigation have created considerable problems for local people. So a lot of the, the, the problems of, of uh, migrants coming, trying to get to Europe across the Mediterranean stems from these changes um, in this, the, the, this region of Africa. And again, just as you can see how, uh, if it's displaced millions of people, how many, uh, how many different types of wildlife will also have been seriously negatively affected. And that leads to conflict. Conflict is a, a major issue uh, because of, largely because of resources. But I just found this, just looking at the white-breasted guinea fowl account on the, BBC, uh, the BirdLife uh, data zone. During the recent conflict, forest in Cote d'Ivoire was logged illegally and opportunistically. And this just gives you another little hint about how conflict can have a devastating effect on our ability to protect areas. Uh, and here's a, a map, a uh, recent map of the, the, the estimation of, of intensity of conflict in Africa. And it, the, the northern half of it doesn't look too great, does it? And if, like me, you're particularly interested in bustards, uh, then trying to do something about the Nubian bustard does not look a particularly tempting uh, thing. Now, hunting is a, a, a big issue. And as far as uh, bushmeat uh, folk are concerned, it's the biggest issue facing wildlife populations. We don't think of it so much in terms of birds, but nonetheless, it is uh, a, a significant issue uh, uh, there as well. Uh, in fact, it was the, the white-breasted guinea fowl account that I was looking at in particular uh, to, to get information on that. And indeed, the guinea fowl suffers very badly. Hunting also has, uh, can even paradoxically, when people are trying to do something about it, can uh, result in problems. So this is to do with the Hubara busted in North Africa. Um, they, they built this billion dollar uh, facility in, in Morocco, which produces a very large numbers of Hubara, but unfortunately these birds are pretty tame. So the, the result is that these birds are walking around uh, and they're going to, either the, the wild population gets hunted out and these birds replace them, or they will miscegenate to some extent with the wild birds and they will produce um, a, a type of uh, bird which is far less adapt, adapted to surviving. So this is likely that it means that we will always having to be release, release um, hubaras into the wild because the wild population will not be able to sustain itself. This is uh, certainly the worry. And um, uh, so the best places to see wild hubaras will be uh, the Eastern Canary Islands. Poaching uh, is the same as hunting, really, but it's uh, with a slightly different bent. But um, poaching is, uh, is important in many parts of Africa. These are Nubian bustards. And across the Sahel, Arabian bustard is being heavily poached, um, and Denim's bustard too. Uh, so these are, are serious issues. In uh, North Africa, and particularly in, 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 in Egypt, we have the problem of trammel nets catching all the migrants uh, in the world, uh, that, that pass through and up the Nile. So this is the, this is the largest offender, Egypt, in terms of catching uh, migrant birds, 5.7 million a year, um, uh, and of all sorts. Poison is yet another uh, a problem, particularly targeting um, uh, vultures. Uh, but uh, vultures uh, suffer very badly. It can be accidental when uh, farmers are baiting against carnivores. It can be deliberate when poachers want to uh, cover their tracks. And it can also be deliberate when traders want their body parts. So in fact, when you look at this, this is again from, from the, the BirdLife uh, report, 60% uh, uh, of the decline is due to poisoning, 30% due to persecution, and 9% due to electrocution and collision. Um, uh, we'll come back to at least collision uh, in a minute. So 20 years ago, we didn't have any threatened vultures uh, uh, on, on the red list. And now we have four species critically endangered and three species endangered. Uh, so an incredibly rapid transformation. Trade is um, a big uh, issue for certain species. This picture looks rather endearing, doesn't it, with the, with the parrot, the gray parrot peering out of its box. It's clearly tethered there, um, but it looks kind of nice, doesn't it? This doesn't look so nice. Um, this kind of horror is being visited on uh, gray parrots uh, everywhere, and it 
suggests that, well, we know that uh, populations have declined hugely. I did a little bit of work um, on the situation in Ghana, and uh, you may well have seen this, uh, the species has virtually disappeared from Ghana now. We also did a bit of work uh, modeling um, what were the ways in which trapping most um, contributed to the problem. Uh, and if you look at these, these three graphs, uh, this is when you just take chicks from the nest, populations actually do moderately well. If you take chicks and while you're up at the nest, you also take the sitting adult, uh, they don't do so well at all. If you just capture indiscriminately, the population goes straight to extinction. And unfortunately, there's many places where it's indiscriminate trapping that's the problem. So I think the African grey has a, a, a very, very uncertain future. Um, it also has an uncertain future because of some work that Rowan Martin, who's here, Rowan, you should stand up and wave, um, <laughs> uh, has done. Uh, it's a, a really important piece of work actually establishing, these are incidentally Timnay parrots, uh, establishing that uh, uh, beak and feather disease is now uh, in wild populations of rose ring parakeets. So where those parakeets come into contact with other species, um, uh, parrot species, there's going to be a problem. And um, uh, this is something that um, it, it, it certainly could be the case that birds that come into captivity are going to be able to transmit their diseases, uh, the, the, this particular virus, across to other species. So if those species are then released back into the wild um, uh, as a, uh, in an attempt to um, bolster populations, uh, then there's a possibility of infecting an entire wild population that way. Power lines uh, are a major uh, problem as well. Um, bustards are particularly um, prone to this, and actually it was Rowan's father, Graham, who actually has, has looked into why this is the case. Uh, but look here, this is, these are uh, Ludwig's bustards in South Africa hitting power lines. The, the, it's this top cable. This, uh, can I do this? Oh, no, I can't, never mind. Um, it's the very top cable there, you can hardly see, that's usually the biggest killer. Birds hit it like this, this is another Ludwig's bustard. Um, and it, it clearly takes a big toll. But it doesn't have to be a big wire, it can even be a small one. I've taken you back to the Lieben Plain. Every time I go there, I find a killed Cory bustard. So that, that picture I show you of um, the birds, um, bef uh, the bird with the feathers was because it had just hit this, this, this wire. It's a tiny little wire. I always thought it was a telephone wire uh, system, but it's obviously a little transmission system, distribution system. This is a Cory busted leg. Here's another one I found last year uh, uh, under these same uh, wires. So the, these tiny little wires, and think how many thousands of their, these there'll be across busted habitats. Um, these tiny wires can kill birds as well. And this uh, paper just recently looked at this situation in the Karoo. Uh, and finding that Ludwig's bustards kill in high volume, but also Cory's as well. So they conclude collisions are, are worryingly high. Indeed, they are. And the same is true of wind farms. Not so much for, for, for bustards, but certainly for birds of prey uh, and indeed for cranes. So that's uh, another thing to add to the shopping basket. Fences too, this is yet another Ludwig's Buster. There's a lot of deaths on fences, many more than we think. And fences are becoming an issue in the whole of Africa now. Look at this little figure for uh, the Great Amara. Um, uh, it's, it's extraordinary how uh, it, the, these fences are being put up at great speed. And these are gonna have serious effects on uh, migrations of mammals, which will be a terrible shame in itself, but will also have ecological consequences, which birds will endure too. Oh, yes, breakneck speed is a very good word uh, to use for, for what the birds do on these fences. So we have this protected area deficit. These are African in important bird areas with little or no protection. There are rather too many of them. Fisheries present a problem too, um, uh, because uh, there's still deaths on long lining, but perhaps the bigger issue at the moment is, is the conflict between uh, the fisheries uh, going after the fish and the seabirds going after the fish. But this shows that this is very serious. You get a lot of cases of uh, seabird colonies starving because the fish have all been fished out by the humans. 
and the biggest area where this is a conflict is highly there in that little, uh, uh, by that arrow, and it's off uh, the west coast of so southern Africa. When that's not hitting those seabirds, they've always got the opportunity to have a bathe in some oil, uh, or they can pick their way through mountains of plastic. So when we look at the, uh, the status, the IUCN status uh, of, of birds uh, on the red list from Africa, um, when we look at the improving status, we find this interesting phenomenon where the birds highlighted in yellow and with I after them means that they're island birds. So these are birds in small, on small islands and we seem to be able to deal quite well with them. When we look at the declining status, we see that uh, the birds that, um, there's only a couple from islands but the ones that are declining are from the African mainland and from Madagascar, uh, and quite seriously. So, so the, the balance is very much against us uh, in this. It's okay when we can work on small islands in contained situations. Here's a lovely picture of Razu larks being released uh, on Santa Lucia in Cape Verde last year. Uh, great stuff, and, and it's been successful. So there's a real conservation triumph, something to be optimistic about but it's on a tiny set of islands. When you've got to deal with much more complicated continental forces, it's a very different proposition. So agriculture, logging, hunting, invasive alien species, and climate change are known to be threatening the top threatened bird species in Africa. Um, forest shrubland, uh, farmland, grassland, wet, and all the major habitats are where these birds live. So these are major challenges for us to address. When we look at the countries, uh, which have the uh, more than threatened, more than 50 threatened species in them, uh, we can see that uh, of the top 10, uh, five of them, 50%, do not have any bird life partner. So we, as an organization, my organization, is really moderately powerless to do anything about um, the, the situation of these birds, and there's an awful lot of them. The African Bird Club has been fantastic, uh, and congratulations on its 25th anniversary. And there's this great thing that contributes 35,000 pounds a year, which I think is completely brilliant. Um, it's not much on the scale of things, but it's incredibly valuable, and it really does make uh, some sort of difference. And the difference is to do with building capacity, which is something obviously incredibly important. Uh, I mentioned um, the two authors on the Bushcrow paper. One of them is at the left-hand end, and one of them is at the right-hand end in this, in this picture. They are um, uh, guards at the Yabello uh, National Park, and here they are. But capacity is a real problem. Uh, tertiary education is commonly not available, or is very poor in parts of Africa. There's no training provided in ecological methods and analysis. There's no training in business and administration, which is the kind of thing that people need if they're going to go on to run an NGO successfully. There are far too few chances to train abroad, and it's far too expensive. 35,000 pounds would just about cover the fees that a British university would charge an African student. No incentive for trainees to stay in conservation. No NGO is uh, no NGO in its sustainability because every project that they do is projectized. In other words, that's how they live. They live off, off, off running projects. And there's no project sustainability. Conservation is forever, but projects always uh, have to terminate at some stage. So building capacity is very, very hard. But then there's Aplori. Um, and this is the one place where a bit of difference is being made. Uh, uh, the Leventis uh, Ornithological Research Institute in Jos, Nigeria. So this is where we actually see uh, some work being done, which I you know, really uh, wholly admire. Uh, in 10 years um, or, or 20 years, they've had uh, 120 students. And if you look at that, the, the 21, 18, and 15, and add the six as well, you've got 60, roughly speaking, of those 120, which, who have gone into something relating to conservation. Uh, they may not all be great at it, but still, that's a, a, a great uh, success. And the, what we need in circumstances like this is more aploris or bigger aploris. Um, here's uh, this is from from their own um, uh, PowerPoint, rather better than mine. It's a marvel, marvelous animated thing. All the, some of the people who've gone on to do important work elsewhere, and then they've got these wonderful things going on in. 
uh, Senegal, uh, Sierra Leone, and Ghana. Um, so so th this has been a, a great step forward. Um, and we clearly need 100 more Aploris scattered around Africa. Look at this. Uh, Will Cresswell um, did this little analysis of re ornithological research capacity. And he concluded that only Nigeria, of all the West African countries, shows a highly significant increase. And this increase was down to a single ornithological research institute established there in 2002. So again, congratulations to Aplori, but it just tells you how serious the situation is elsewhere. So again, Aplori standing in front of the, the forces of doom. Um, or you can look at it another way. Uh, <laughs> desperately fighting against the odds. But anyway, um, so I'm not, I, I'm very optimistic for this uh, little lizard. I, I, I hope he made it. Um, but you know, for a minute I thought we were in trouble. Thank you very much.